the cable. You have the el cable here. What can I say? Uno, uno. No tenemos eco. Ahí está transmitiendo. Uno, uno. Uno, uno, uno. Está bien, no hay eco. Tienes eco allá.
good. Shall we begin? So how was this quiz? This was okay? This quiz was okay? Better? I'm getting easier and easier as time goes on. Um, okay, uh, let me tell you the answers to the homework from yesterday. So the first question was a case where you had a, a microlensing event. So there's one of these light curves where the star gets brighter and fainter. And you can measure the event duration, TE, for this microlensing curve by fitting to the, to the formula that we discussed last, uh, yesterday. And so the question was, once you have this time duration, and if you know how fast the lens is moving, because you understand something about galaxy dynamics, then what can you tell about the mass of the lens? And so uh, you have all the information that you need. The, once you have the time duration and the speed, you actually work out the Einstein radius directly. It's just the product of the speed times the event duration. And then once you know the Einstein radius and you know the distances involved, then you can work out the mass. So it's a very simple solution. If you put in the numbers, if you put in the numbers, then you get that the mass is 0.017 solar masses divided by this x times 1 minus x, where x is the ratio between the distance to the lens and the distance to the source. So if you have the full distance to the source here, then x is the fraction along the line of sight where your lens lives. And so I asked you, x is 10 kiloparsecs, x is 30 kiloparsecs, and x is 50 kiloparsecs. Sorry, ds, dd. And so it's simply a question of putting in the numbers. So if you have a, the lens close by, then you get a fairly large mass because lensing is not very efficient. When you put the lens roughly halfway, you get a lower mass because the lensing effect is more efficient. And when you put the lens right on top of the source, then you actually need an infinite mass. You cannot make lensing when the, the lens is right on top of the source. Was this problem OK? People could do this? Good. And then the second one, of course, is, is Jorge still here? No, Jorge has left. So this was the question about the asteroid, uh, which we wanted to be able to act like a microlens. And the thing you have to realize for this question is that if you have a a body which is small but not a point, then if you're unlucky, then instead of having the nice microlensing configuration like this, you would have a microlensing configuration where the light rays try to go through, through the asteroid, through the rock. And so that cannot be. Of course, this is not a, a proper light path because the, the light cannot go through the rocks. And so the condition is that the radius of the object of the lens has to be smaller than the Einstein radius so that the light can go around it instead of having to go through it. And then again, it's a question of filling in the numbers. To get the, um, to solve this equation, the mass, I didn't give you the mass, but I told you the density and the radius. And so you can work out the mass easily enough as the volume times the densities, you get an r cubed in here, which cancels some of these r powers, but there is, you can simply solve the equation. Which answers did people get? I'm curious. How far away do we have to put Jorge before he can microlens? No numbers? One parsec. One kiloparsec. I think I got 500 parsec. So half a kiloparsec. But it's always, because these units are always very complicated, with, it's easy to make a mistake. So I'm not 100% sure of my answer. But I think it should be something of this, of this order, certainly. So very far, very far. 
Okay, and so this is actually the reason why when I showed you the diagram yesterday of all the, uh, the upper limits, when I showed you the mass of the, of the lens versus the halo fraction, that the results from all these macho experiments where we had this kind of thick contour that was an upper limit. The reason why down here we don't have more constraints below about 10 to the minus 7, I think it was solar masses, is that you run, run into problems like this, that you run into finite lens effects. All right. Uh, the second thing, any questions on this still? So I think if this was okay, then the quiz should have been okay too. The second thing, Jorge told me that in the quiz from yesterday, there on, you did okay, but there was a couple of questions where almost everybody went wrong. And so maybe I should quickly talk about those for a second. One is, um, maybe I can get it on the screen. Can you read this? It's too small, it's okay. So the, um, uh, one of the questions, this 2C was a problem. So this is the case where you have a quasar that makes five images in an isometric cross. So you have a configuration of, a, of an Einstein cross, as it's called. So you have a fifth faint image in the middle and then four images like this. And the question was, what can you tell about the lens in this case? So part A, this shows the lens is not round because it's a round lens can only make either two images or a ring, but it cannot make this five-fold symmetry. This needs axisymmetric. Um, by symmetry, you can see that the source lies right on the axis, lies right behind the lens, so this was true. If you put the quasar somewhere off the side, then you will get still multiple images, maybe, but they will not be symmetric like this. But the third question was, can this lens produce an Einstein ring? And almost all of you thought it could. But the lens is not axisymmetric, symmetric so there's no way that you can make a, a nice circular uh, ring, because the way to make an Einstein ring is to put the source right behind the lens. And we see that that gives you four images, but not a full ring. So it's only when the lens is axisymmetric that you would be able to make the, the full Einstein ring, not when you have a, a, an elliptical lens. And the other question, but there were lots of problems, but I think we discussed this yesterday after the homework was number three. This is where you have uh, time, di uh, time variations. You have a quasar and it flashes and then you get the same flash in the different images at different times. And we talked about the shape of the Fermat potential that shows you that the minima give you the first arrival, then the saddle points, and then the, the maximum. But I think you did the quiz just before we discussed this, which is why you still didn't have the answer. Okay. So much for microlensing and for strong lensing. Today we're going to talk about the third uh, context in which gravitational lensing is very important, which is what we call weak gravitational lensing. Maybe this will work. Yes. Um, and so weak lensing talks about basically all the, other, all the other cases. Strong lensing happens right very close to the lens where you have very strong uh, gravitational fields, str large reflection angles, strong, uh, you know, almost critical surface mass density. Weak lensing happens much further from the lens. So it's where there is still some deflection, right? We saw that the potential doesn't stop, so the light deflection keeps on existing also farther from the lens, but it's much, much smaller, and it's far too small to make multiple images. So it's the case where you're making single distortions, but not multiple images. And the problem is that we're not doing a laboratory experiment. We cannot take away the lens, what the galaxy looked like before, and then see how it was distorted. So we cannot measure this effect directly, galaxy by galaxy. We cannot see how far the light has been moved. But it turns out that we can measure the gradient of this motion, because the gradient causes systematic distortions in the shapes of galaxies, and that's what weak lensing is about, and that's what, well, what I will try to explain to you today. So here is an example. This is, if you were in the lecture last night, you will recognize some of these pictures. This is. Um, 
the effect of a lens in front of, this is a weak lens now, so there's no strong lensing involved, no multiple imaging. This is the effect of having a, a weak gravitational lens in front of a nice rectangular grid. And you see that as you make the lens stronger, then the, uh, you begin to see the effect of the lensing. You see the images being pushed outwards, uh, as we know now from the lens equation, right? This, this source was here and is being pushed into the image plane away from the lens. Now, if we had this kind of graph paper on the distant universe, life would be very easy because we can see the effect directly then. But of course, we don't have these nice lines. Instead, we have a sky full of galaxies. And so this is exactly the same transformation, but now applied to a, a, an image with round blobs on it and not nice graph paper. And so you still see the same effects. You see that, that the lens, as you make it stronger, starts to push away the sources away from the middle. And you see that here, close to the center, you end up with sources not only being pushed away, but also being magnified and being slightly distorted. So you can imagine that if you had a sky like this, you might be able to see this, this effect and try to measure it. Uh, but the sky is actually more complicated than this still, because all the galaxies are different. In this case here, all the galaxies were, in the previous case, all the galaxies were nice and round blobs. But in fact, some of them are round, some of them are very thin edge-on spiral disks, some are at an angle. So you have a large variety of shapes, and it's out of this large variety of shapes that you still have to try to see if you can recognize this weak lensing effect. And it turns out that you can. It turns out that there are techniques to take this picture here and notice that there is a systematic distortion of the galaxies uh, present. And the way you do this is by measuring galaxy ellipticities. So for every galaxy, fit an ellipse. Basically, an ellipse has a long axis and a short axis and an orientation. So you need three parameters, A, B, and the position angle, EA. And from that, we can define an ellipticity in the following way. We can define this in a kind of polar coordinate of ellipticity, which has a magnitude and an angle. And the magnitude is this ratio of the, the long and the short axes. So when the, the two axes are the same length, then E is equal to 0, the ellipticity is 0. When B is very small and A is very long, this number goes to 1. So ellipticity of 1 means a very elongated object. Ellipticity of 0 means a very round object. And then we take the position angle of the major axis and we multiply it by 2. And that's how we define our, uh, our polar coordinates for ellipticity. And the reason why we multiply it by 2 is that if you take this angle or you take it 180 degrees around, it looks exactly the same. Whether you put the minor, major axis here or here, it doesn't make any difference. You see the same shape on the sky. And so the diagram there on the right shows you in this full plane of ellipticity, E1 and E2, with the origin in the middle. It shows you the round galaxies in the middle, where E is equal to 0. It shows you the very elongated galaxies on the ring, where E gets close to 1. And it shows you the different orientations uh, as you rotate the galaxies. So this is one way of putting every possible ellipticity in a single diagram uh, in a nice mathematical way. Right? So things here on the right are stretched in this direction. On the left are stretched vertically. Here they're stretched diagonally in the positive way. Here they're stretched diagonally in the negative way. And this is actually exactly the effect of a gamma 1 and a gamma 2 operation, shear, on a circular source. So if you take a round galaxy and you imagine distorting it with a gamma 1, gamma 2 distortion matrix like we've seen before in lensing, then you would get, you can just replace these E1 and E2 by gamma 1 and gamma 2 and you would get exactly this diagram. So a gamma 1 term stretches things horizontally, a negative gamma 1 stretches things vertically, a positive gamma 1 stretches things diagonally, and a negative gamma 1 stretches them across along the other diagonal. And so this shows that, that the, there's a relation between the shear, which is the gradient of the deflection angle, and the ellipticities of the galaxies that we can try to measure. I notice that if you take a whole family of galaxies um, and you put them a point for every galaxy in this diagram, then you will get a cloud of points, and that cloud of points will always be centered symmetrically on the middle. And the reason is that no matter how elliptical the galaxies are, the orientation of the galaxies is random. And so for every galaxy that appears like this, its partner will appear here on the other side, and so the average of those two things in this diagram will always be zero. The orientations are random, so this cloud will be symmetric 
about the center of the diagram. And this is our key test for trying to see whether there is any lensing going on. So let's see how this works. Here is that same diagram again. And here I've taken a whole cloud of points, a whole bunch of galaxies, and plotted them in this E1, E2 plane without there being any gravitational lensing. And now let's see what happens when we distort all these galaxies, when we stretch all these galaxies in a particular direction, as if there were a gravitational lens somewhere off the side that's squeezing that part of the sky, distorting it in a certain direction. So what you can see, imagine that you try to, to stretch things horizontally. What you will see is that these things would get even more stretched. So all the galaxies here would move to the right. They would get more stretched. These galaxies would get a little bit rounder, right? They would get less elongated, so they would also move to the right. Up here, if you stretch a galaxy like that, you would also end up pulling it more in that direction. So again, it would move to the right, and the same thing here. So a single a shear has a coherent effect moving all the galaxies in the same direction on this diagram. And what I'll show you now is a little animation of how this works in this uh, point. So I've taken all these ellipticities, stretched them, measured the ellipticity again, and you see that this whole family of points is wandering sideways along the direction here that I have applied in this calculation. And so the effect is that you start off with a, a cloud of points, a cloud of ellipticities centered on the origin, centered on zero, and the net effect is that the cloud is now moved away from the center. And so if you take a part of the sky, you measure lots of ellipticities, and you see that the average is not in the middle, but somewhere offside. That's a sign that the whole piece of sky has been systematically squeezed or distorted. And that's how we look for gravitational, weak gravitational lensing. Is this clear? And so you, when, when the weak lensing is fairly strong, which sounds a bit strange, but when, nonetheless, when, when the weak lensing is fairly strong, then you can actually see this by eye. So you can imagine taking a piece of sky, measuring lots of galaxies, plotting each of them in ellipticity, and then this is a case where uh, the ellipticities of the galaxies intrinsically are very broad. There are lots of very elongated galaxies, but nevertheless here you can see that this cloud is not quite sitting in the middle, but is a little bit offset to the right. If you have a kind of galaxies where there's lots of round galaxies, you have a very strong clump in the center of this cloud, and that's a much more sensitive way of, uh, of seeing whether there is an offset or not. So the center of this cloud are the galaxies which are intrinsically round, which are the average galaxies, which don't have a preferred direction. If that center of the cloud is not at zero, but somewhere else, then you know that the whole population has been distorted. And so this is something you can measure statistically. With one galaxy, you know very little. But if you have 1,000 galaxies, you can average, and you can get a very accurate measurement of the center. So the accuracy, just like in all statistics, goes like 1 over the square root of the number of galaxies that you're averaging over. Now, of course, the point is that the shear will be different on different parts of the sky. So it's not like you're squeezing the whole sky in the same direction. There will be differences. And so we're going to be dealing with maps of these distortions, and we're going to try to recover maps of the shear out of a large number of galaxies on the sky. And so the way you handle this, you take a part of the sky, and you basically interpolate the, the average ellipticity of the galaxies over the sky. You smooth it with some sort of a kernel uh, to try to, to increase the signal to noise. And so the accuracy with which you can do this is set by the number of galaxies that you have. The more galaxies you have in your map, the more fine the resolution with which you can measure this effect. Right. So the next question is, how do you actually measure ellipticities of galaxies in practice? And this is actually not so easy. The Here's a, this is a real piece of the sky. So all these are real galaxies. And these are quite distant galaxies, which means they're really small. And so I don't think there's a star. Maybe this is a star in this image. I'm not sure. Probably not. But, but all these galaxies are not seen as they really are because they're, they're seen through the atmosphere and through a telescope, and so they're slightly blurred. And so all these galaxies actually are rounder, look rounder than they really are, because this blurring has the effect of making sources a little bit rounder. Also, these images are noisy. Certainly, the, more the fainter galaxies in these, you cannot really measure a very accurate shape for these things simply because, of, uh, because the observations are noisy. And so, nevertheless, what you have to try to do is for each of these galaxies, 
get as good an estimate as possible of the ellipticity so that you can put it in this cloud and make this average uh, to measure the shear. And there are various ways in which people do this. Either you try to fit a kind of model to each of these galaxies and take the ellipticity of the model, or you try to take some sort of second moments of each galaxy and use that to, to estimate an ellipticity. And both methods are valid. They're different approaches. They're both being used by different groups. The moment method that people start, and many people still use, is called KSB, which is after the authors, Kaiser, Squires, and Broadhurst, who first worked this method out. And it relies on ellipticities that are derived from second moments. So if you take a galaxy and you measure the mean x squared and you measure the mean y squared, then that's a quick way to see whether the galaxy is, is flattened or not. So if you have a If you have a nice round galaxy, this is, this is a bad color, right? If you have a round galaxy, there can be spiral structure in this or something, but, but on average the galaxy is round, then what you would get is that the mean position of x and of y in this galaxy are the same, right? You get the, this is a symmetric distribution. So this means that the ellipticity is close to zero. But if you have a very flattened galaxy, then you would get an x squared, which is much larger than a y squared. The typical values of x are much larger than the typical values of y in this galaxy. And you can also think about how this transforms when you rotate, and that's where also the, the value of the product becomes important. So you can measure these second moments for each galaxy and try to turn them into an ellipticity. And the way this is normally done is this here. You have the, the second moments W, and you can construct things which behave just like ellipticities. You can show that they're always aligned with each axis. They rotate in the same way, et cetera, et cetera. And the point is that you can, uh, you can try to do this in noisy galaxies, and it will, it will give you big problems. So you have to somehow suppress the noise in the outer parts of the galaxies where the galaxies are very faint. And so what is done in KSB, and I'm going to spare you all the details, is that you can work out what the effect of these ellipticities as defined like this is, how these will change when you apply a shear to this galaxy, when you stretch it by a certain gamma 1 or gamma 2. Right. And you can see here the ellipticity that you observe is the intrinsic ellipticity plus some complicated expression which relates to how the, the point spread function, the blurring of the image is changing the ellipticity, plus another complicated expression which is related to the shear, which I've called G here instead of gamma, but it's the same thing almost. And so these polarizabilities, which are these P's, this whole KSB paper is about how you calculate these from galaxies. So that becomes very technical. Uh, it's not very interesting to, to know the details, but the point is that there is a way to measure these ellipticities in such a way that we can use them uh, to figure out uh, the strength of the weak lensing effect. The alternative is to model sources directly. So instead of measuring these ellipticities, you simply say, I know how blurry my image is. I know what galaxies look like, so I'm going to find the best possible model that looks like the, the little image that I have on the sky. And you can model various kinds. You can use various kinds of models of this again. The details are not interesting. One possibility is to use this shapeless basis functions, which is actually very nice also for many other things, is to take the galaxies and to decompose them into a basis of uh, orthogonal basis functions. So again, the mathematics are here in case you're ever interested. If you're going to end up doing research on gravitational lensing, you're going to see this again. If you're not going to do research in gravitational lensing, you will never want to see this again. So I'm just showing it to you, but I won't explain the details. I'll show you a little movie. Can we switch the lights off for this? Pablo? Could you hit the lights? Thank you. Thanks. So this, no, this is good. Um, so this is one of these uh, families of orthonormal functions. So you see the parent function is uh, basically a round Gaussian distribution. And then these, as you go to higher and higher order to the right, you have more and more complicated things which are 
generated by multiplying by polynomials. And these are actually the eigenfunctions of the quantum harmonic oscillator in two dimensions, it turns out. So you may have seen these functions before in other contexts. It's the gauss hermite polynomials multiplied by... And so what you do is you take a real galaxy. Here's a picture of a real galaxy. And you try to fit it as a sum of lots of these different components. And here you see, as you add more terms together, you see the, so let's start again. Here you see the, the galaxy being built up by adding more and more and more components with more and more fine structure. And you see that in the end, when you include all the terms, you end up with a galaxy that looks pretty much like what you started with. Right? So the higher order that you take, the sharper the features you're able to fit, and the closer you can make it look like a real galaxy. So this is a very flexible formalism. It's an orthonormal basis function. In principle, you can make it as much as you get as accurate as you like. Here's another example of a different galaxy, different type, much more peaky galaxy, and you see the same thing. And so the point about these shapelets is that they also are very nicely, they have very nice properties about how they react to transformation under a, a shear. So here's a third one. This one has some blobs in it, so this is more difficult. And so you see that you have to go to quite high order before you begin to see the blobs also in your model. So this is one of the many ways in which people try to basically reduce the noise in images by fitting with a model that, that has some reasonable uh, properties. Okay, so who knows? If any of you end up doing gravitational lensing research, then you may have to play with these. So the point of gravitational lensing is that we want to try to understand the mass distribution on the sky, particularly the dark matter distribution that we cannot see directly. We would like to map it using the gravitational deflection that it causes. And so the, what I will show you next is how you can make a measurement of weak lensing and use it to turn that into a measurement of the mass distribution on the sky. So we want to start from the shear information, which is what we can measure, right? These average ellipticities in different parts of the sky. And we want to turn that into an estimate of the gravitational potential or of the mass distribution that generates it. And so this is hard work because it's a very noisy measurement. You have all these, these uh, problems. Uh, we have the, the shape noise. The galaxies themselves you know, are, have their own individual shape. So you have to average many galaxies to get a reasonable measurement. There's also, it's no longer a pure two-dimensional problem like we've been doing for lensing before. The lenses are spread over three dimensions. And there's also, it turns out, aspects of the mass sheet degeneracy which make weak lensing more complicated. But nonetheless, it's... Uh, it's turning out to be a very fruitful, fruitful uh, area of research. For example, you can make pictures like this. This is the famous bullet cluster, where many of you must have seen this before. So this is a, a case where two clusters of galaxies pass through each other at high speed. And galaxy clusters consist of galaxies, but also of a lot of hot gas that you can see in X-rays in Röntgen telescopes. And what you can see in, these, in this picture in pink this is the hot gas that's emitting in, in Röntgen, in X-rays. And the structure of this hot gas is very strange. One, the, one it, it no longer sits inside the clusters. It's been blasted out of the clusters. And that's because when this guy, which is called the bullet, passed through this cluster here, the gas that was in the bullet basically had a ramp pressure interaction with the gas that was in the main cluster and they stopped each other. So they blew the gas out of each other as they, as they went through it. Think of two gas clouds going through each other. All the molecules and the atoms inside collide with each other and stop. And so the galaxies kept on going, but the gas was slowed down and ended up kind of hanging in between the two bodies of the cluster. And what you can do with weak lensing is you can try to measure the gravitational field of this whole complicated system and figure out what the mass distribution is. And the mass distribution is shown in blue. And it shows that most of the mass is sitting where the galaxies are, not where the hot gas is. And that's interesting because actually most of the atoms that we see are actually in the hot gas and not in the galaxies. So a, a, a big galaxy cluster contains much more mass in hot gas than what's actually in the galaxies and formed into stars. And so what this shows is that this cluster, when it crashed, it was actually pulled apart and the dark matter stuck with the galaxies and the hot gas was blown out of the, of the cluster. So that shows that the dark matter is not like hot gas. It doesn't collide. 
it's collisionless, it can pass straight through each other just like the stars do, which is probably what you get from a very small, weakly interacting particle rather than from some, some uh, I don't know, the dark matter were some form of the, of the hot gas, it would, all the, the mass would be sitting here and not here around these clusters. So this is the sort of measurement you can only make with weak lensing. This is a system which is very much out of equilibrium. So you cannot measure masses in any other way, but with weak lensing you can see very clearly where the mass is. Question? Um, in this case, you are you're measuring the weak lensing of the galaxies in the background. That are, like That's their right. light is passing through the, That's right. through the two clusters. Okay. So many of these things here have nothing to do with the clusters, but are sitting in the background. And they're all being distorted by the gravitational field of this entire mass concentration. And so we can try to make a map of the full mass distribution, which is what gives you these two blue blobs. I'll explain how to do this next. So this is the summary of the bullet cluster. Collision between two galaxy clusters. The hot gas ended up hanging in the middle because of the pressure. The galaxies went straight through. And most of the mass of the galaxies, which is the dark matter hanging around the galaxy halos and in the clusters. So you can do real physics with a system like this, thanks to gravitational lensing. <coughs> OK, time for some equations. These are equations you've seen before. This is the, the different terms in the distortion matrix, if you remember. We had the convergence and then the two shear components. And here is the lensing potential, which I've, sorry, I've called psi here instead of, uh, no, I've called psi as before. Um, uh, and it's here I've, I've put the dimensional potential so we have the constants in front. So we can, as we've been doing the whole week, we can make the dimension lensing potential little psi, which here I've called phi, I'm sorry, by absorbing all the dimensions into a factor. And so what we can observe using these ellipticities of galaxies are these gammas. But what we want to know is kappa because kappa is the surface mass density which tells us where the material in the lens is. So the question is, can we go from the gammas to kappa? Can we make measurements of these quantities and deduce measurements of these quantities? And if you think about it, it's possible, it looks reasonable that you can because you're measuring all kinds of gradients of the lensing potential. And in the end, what you want to derive is some other property of the same lensing potential. So if you can use this to solve for the lensing potential, you can certainly also derive this quantity again. And it turns out that this relationship is actually rather nice, particularly when you go into, into Fourier space. But let's look at the equations and see how this works. So let's go into Fourier modes. Imagine that the potential consists of lots of different waves. We'd make the Fourier transform. So the potential is decomposed as a whole bunch of different uh, components of different wavelengths. Those of you who are going to follow interferometry next week, you'd better make sure you have your Fourier theory in order because you're going to be living in Fourier space next week. So this is just to help you. I'm trying to be nice to you, not nasty. So you take the Fourier transform of the potential, uh, then the gradients simply become multiplications, right? You know this? And so then this differential equation becomes a simple algebraic equation which you can solve very nicely. So the Fourier transform of kappa becomes simply K1 times K1 times the Fourier transform of the potential plus K2 times K2 times the Fourier transform with factors of I, which is why you get these minus signs. And similarly for gamma 1, you get minus K1 squared plus K2 squared. And gamma 2 gives you 2K1, K2. Right? Simply turning the derivatives into multiplication by the respective wave number. And this is a very simple equation to solve once you have Right, so you measure gamma 1 and gamma 2. So suppose you have these and you want this. Then it turns out it's a simple transformation to get kappa out of either gamma 1 or gamma 2. But it's much better to combine the information and write it as a combination of the Fourier transforms of gamma 1 and gamma 2 and avoid any singularities in the bottom here. And this doesn't look too bad. Right? If you've measured this shear field and you've taken the Fourier transform then you can quickly get to the Fourier transform of kappa, invert it, and get the surface mass density in your lens. And if you look at the coefficients, they're actually nothing more than rotations in Fourier space. Right? K1 squared minus K2 squared over K squared is just the cosine of twice the, the azimuth 
in k space if you go to polar coordinates. Similarly, this is the sine of twice that angle in phase space. And so this means that the power spectrum of kappa and gamma is actually the same. So if all you want is the power spectrum of the mass distribution to do statistics in cosmology, you're actually ha happy once you have the power spectrum of the shear because it's exactly the same. The amplitude of kappa and the amplitude of gamma is the same. Now imagine that you do this to a real data set. So you measure all your ellipticities, you measure your gamma field, you do the Fourier transforms, etc. You get the kappa transform, you transform back and you get a map of kappa over your part of the sky that you're studying. Now Fourier transforms happy in, happen in complex space and so the kappa that you get, the surface mass density, is going to be a complex number. Which is very strange because the surface mass density is something very real. And so this is actually a very nice test. So if the data are perfect, then you should get only a real number. You should not get a complex part. Because you have noise, because there may be mistakes in the data, because there may be problems. Um, in general, you do get a complex component of kappa. And you know that this is spurious. This is not real, obviously, because it's a complex number. But it's not, it's not physical. It's, uh, it's simply a, a, a test of the level of systematic errors or uncertainties that you have in your reconstruction. And in fact, you can show this is related to B modes, just like the B modes that we have in polarization of the cosmic microwave background. And notice also that you cannot define the K equals zero mode, so the, the, the mode that sets the average surface mass density. You cannot actually deduce from this formula because you end up dividing by zero. And so only mass contrasts are sensitive to lensing an overall mass for mass distribution, the K is constant, or the K is zero mode in Fourier space is not measurable by lens. And this again is related to the mass sheet degeneracy. Only mass contrasts uh, are detectable by lens. So here's an example. Take a large, this is a simulation, but you imagine you have a large piece of the sky, you measure everywhere what these shear components are, so everywhere you plot this little vector of the average ellipticity of galaxies in that small part of the sky, and that gives you your gamma 1 and gamma 2 field which you Fourier transform. That's the little sticks, that's the ellipticities, and when you do this reconstruction of the mass distribution that's uh, able to cause this, this pattern, you get the colors, the green and the blue behind it, and you see that around all the regions where the shears are kind of tangentially aligned, that's where your mass concentration ends up putting where your mass reconstruction ends up putting a mass concentration. So you're basically looking for this pattern of aligned galaxies, and that is a signpost of mass concentrations in the middle of those things. So this is effectively what this reconstruction does. It looks for patterns of tangentially aligned shear and turns that into a, a mass concentration. So you can do this transformation in both directions. You can also make a mass distribution and predict what the shear field will be. In Fourier space, it's completely symmetric. You can go in both directions. So this is what you do in, in weak gravitational lensing. You make these maps and use it to reconstruct the mass distribution. And then you either study, for example, this massive cluster. You, can, you now know, have a good idea of what the mass of this cluster is, so you can study this object more. Or you can look at the number of clusters over the field. You can make the power spectrum of the mass distribution. You can do all the statistics that you like out of this reconstruction. And remember, the important thing is that you're measuring all the mass here. It doesn't care whether there's a galaxy sitting somewhere. You don't need to know where the light is. You're purely measuring the distribution of mass through its effect on the, the paths of the light without, uh, without needing a signpost, without needing a galaxy to tell you where the mass might be. There's one small problem, which is with boundary effects, this Fourier uh, formalism assumes that you're transforming, you're integrating from infinity, from minus infinity to plus infinity. Of course, we only have a small part of the sky to work with usually, so you have to make some fix for how, for what happens at the edge of your data. And there's, again, various techniques for this which work fairly well. Uh, different choice give you slightly different answers near the edge, but usually in the middle you have pretty much the same answer. And so there's lots of different mass reconstruction methods that people have developed. And in fact, th this, is, this list is a few years old. There's already a few more. Yeah. All trying to solve the same problem. If I measure lots of ellipticities, how do I get 
the distribution of mass. Okay. Um, when you do this in practice, and so my research involves a lot of this, is you um, you end up having to deal with noise. So all the data, data are not perfect. You don't have you have missing you have gaps in the data. You have bad measurements. You have measurement errors. Uh, you have galaxies in certain positions, but not in others. And so the observed shear field that you start with is actually very noisy and is also discrete. It's just identified. It's just defined at a few points. And so you have to smooth over this information to try to make the full field before you can take the Fourier transform, for example. And the smoothing works very well, but it does other things to your noise. It ends up smoothing your noise as well. So it, it, again, it gets very complicated, which means that when you see one of these maps, it can be, look very nice. But you have to be very careful interpreting the information, because these correlations uh, can work their way. You know, a blob somewhere may actually cause you a blob somewhere else uh, without it being necessarily physical. So in practice, what people do is lots of what's called Monte Carlo simulations. You just make lots of random maps where you put lots of galaxies in at random, put them through the lensing effect, do the reconstruction, add in all the noise properties that you have in your real data, and just see how reliable your reconstruction works, how well it works. So often you do many more analyses on these simulations than you do on the real data. Okay. You want to wake everybody up. Um, so this was about trying to measure the statistics, the large scale distribution of mass by looking at these Fourier modes. What you also want to do is you want to be able to measure, like in the Bullock cluster, for example, you want to be able to measure the mass of a cluster out to a very large radius, not just in the middle where you may have maybe have strong lensing measurements, but out to as large a radius as you can, as far away as you can see this weak lensing effect. And so again, the weak lensing works for this. You don't need strong lenses to be able to, to measure this, to measure masses from lensing. Uh, rem remember that the tangential shear is related to the average kappa minus kappa at the radius, right? We had this, we had this relation before. So the average mass density within a certain radius minus the mass density at the radius is what gives you the tangential shear. And so, in fact, if you take a lens and you average over a ring, even if the lens is not symmetric, nonetheless, on average, this relation still holds. So you can get the average tangential shear along a ring is still going to give you the average enclosed kappa minus the average kappa on the ring. And so you can write this as the inter an integral over the mass distribution where you've got the, the full mass distribution on the sky multiplied by some weighting function, where in this case the weighting function is just 1 out to the radius where you've got your shear, and then to 0. It's just a strange way of rewriting this equation, but you can then change this w into different functions which are more useful. So this is a way of measuring, again, I'm not going to go through all the details, but this is ways of measuring on a circle of the sky how much mass is enclosed just by measuring the shear on rings in the sky around those circles. And I think I have it in a diagram here. <coughs> so if you want to know how much mass there is in this whole area, then it helps to measure the gravitational shear, the tangential shear over a ring around it. And so what you can do is when you have a large map of the sky, you can put lots and lots of these rings on the sky, measure the mass enclosed in each of them, and see how much it varies, how much it fluctuates. And again, it's a different way of measuring the clumpiness of the dark matter distribution, whether smooth or whether there's a very large mass and very small mass. So this, this is a, another way of getting at the power spectrum of the, of the mass distribution by measuring lots of different masses and looking at the way they scatter. And this whole field is called cosmic shear. It's sheared not by individual clusters, for example, but sheared average by the, the overall large scale distribution of mass. And again, lots of different ways of doing this in practice, but the principle is always the same. Simply pick lots of areas of the sky and estimate how much mass is enclosed in it using the tangential shear around that area. Um, let's see. Yeah, I can still do this. So the, 
So this is two different kinds. You can you can do the statistical. Cosmic shear. And there you don't care where you put the circles. You really you take your sky and you put circles down everywhere and you simply measure the the power spectrum of of the mass density. But you can also do something else. You can also say, I see lots of galaxies. I see lots of things which might be lensing. And I would like to know how much mass sits in each of these galaxies. I want to learn something about the galaxies. And that's what's called galaxy galaxy lensing. I don't have a stammer. That's what it's called. And that's because distant galaxies are being lensed by foreground galaxies. And again, not in the sense of strong lensing, but now also in the sense of, of weak lensing. So what you do here is you pick a, a galaxy on the sky, and you measure the average shear around it. And that tells you something about the mass enclosed, the mass associated with the galaxy. The trouble is, when you're in the weak lensing regime, that measurement for one galaxy is going to be incredibly noisy, because you really did, it's a very weak signal. The background galaxies are very elongated and in lots of different The average ellipticity will be very poorly measured. And so what you have to do is do a statistical approach and measure lots and lots and lots of different galaxies and combine the measurements. When you do that, when you can measure the average shear around a galaxy, you're basically measuring this kappa bar, of average kappa minus kappa. So you're measuring a kind of mass contrast, again, associated with the galaxy in units of the critical density. So you're looking for this effect. You have a foreground lens, and around each foreground lens, you look whether the nearby galaxies in the background are slightly tangentially aligned. And by averaging over enough galaxies, you can measure this effect to down to very low levels, in fact. So this is how it works. Imagine that you have a patch of sky with lots of foreground lenses, that's the gray things, and lots of background lenses, which are the the orange galaxies, then from this picture, you're not going to use very much. Each of these galaxies is being lensed by the nearby lens, but by such a small amount that you cannot see it. But if you average all the information, if you do a kind of stacking analysis, so you put them all on top of each other, then it's like you, you add more and more and more background galaxies to try to make this measurement. And now you might imagine that you can begin to detect a coherent tangential shear around this stack. And in practice, we do this with tens of thousands of galaxies try to measure very accurately the average shear behind galaxies. Yeah. When, when you do this average of the galaxies, don't you have to assume some kind of similarity between the, the galaxies you're averaging? You end up getting, <coughs> what you end up measuring is the average mass associated with this whole sample of galaxies that you've chosen. And you're right, you should, if you choose your sample smartly, then you get much more useful information than if you simply throw all the galaxies mm -hmm. together. If you, if, you have a, if you have a distribution with a, with a large standard deviation, you, you wouldn't be able to tell individual things about the galaxies. You wouldn't measure the standard deviation. You would measure the mean. You could mm -hmm. measure the mean, but the, the scatter, the standard deviation, is mm -hmm. very hard to measure. So typically what people do, for example, is pick uh, bright round galaxies, bright red galaxies, or spiral galaxies, or galaxies that you can identify in some other way and simply only stack those to try to get a, some information about one particular class of galaxies. Then you repeat it for a different class of galaxies and you see if there are differences. So you assume that all these galaxies are independently distributed on the sky. You just have galaxies everywhere. You pick a galaxy as the lens and then use all the other galaxies on average, their effect will cancel out. So you can really think of this one galaxy as being as lensing all the, the other background galaxies. So on average, the tangential shear around that galaxy is caused by just that one single lens. And then you repeat this experiment with lots of other galaxies and average all the results until you start to get a high signal to noise. Right? It's like the stacking that I just showed you. And so. This is where you measure the tangential shear. Around there, when you have a very exaggerated lens, then you would see a very clear tangential alignment like this, like we see around clusters of galaxies close to the, the strong lensing region in the middle. But the same pattern, weaker and weaker and weaker, persists out to extremely 
very large radii. In principle, you could also measure a different component of the shear, which is one that's uh, rotated at 45 degrees to it. And this is related to this B mode. So that looks like, like this. Right? The tangential shear is that one. And this is what's called the cross shear, the other component. And gravitational lensing is not able to do this because this, is, this introduces a kind of rotational symmetry. And if you remember, the distortion matrix was symmetric. It cannot make a rotation. So whenever in your measurement you discover that there is a significant lensing tangential shear in this direction, then you know there's something wrong with your data. Something has gone wrong either in your correction of the, the blurring by the telescope or in your selection of galaxies or in your measurement of ellipticities or whatever. But this is a very good sanity check that your measurements are accurate. Really, uh, and it's related, in fact, when you, when you do a mass reconstruction, this is the term that gives it the imaginary component of kappa in the Fourier component. But, so it's, it's the same test we need. So in practice, we always do this. We always plot the tangential shear that we measure and also this control to get an estimate of the, the level of noise in our analysis. <coughs> so in practice, you, it's, as you say, it's very important to define your lens sample sensibly. You either pick a range of redshifts or a range of colors or a range of brightnesses or whatever, morphology. And then you take a source sample of galaxies which are mostly behind there, and then you do this analysis, compiling all the lens source pairs, calculating the tangential shear, and averaging away. And so the way to get high signal to noise is to just add more and more and more and more of these galaxies. And you're limited basically by the number of galaxies in a ring around the average lens. So the more background galaxies you have, the more accurate you can make this measurement, just like in cosmic shear. And so this is what we call shape noise. It's really, if all the background galaxies were intrinsically round, you read off the shear just from every single galaxy, because you know it was round initially, so any ellipticity would be caused by lensing. That's not the case. Instead, we have to deal with this, this wide variety of shapes of background galaxies, which are our shape noise. And so once you have the shear that tells you your lensing potential around the, around the lenses, you need to know the lens and the source redshifts to calculate the critical density, which sets the scale for the effect that you're measuring on the sky. And so again, this makes your, your analysis a bit more complicated. Some of the lenses will be a different redshift, so you're measuring the same angle on the sky corresponds to a different physical scale in the galaxy. So it's even messy to work out which average you're actually constructing when you're stacking all these galaxies. So that's why it's always nice to try to stack lenses which are more or less at the same redshift. And also you can have sources at different redshifts. And that means different sources are uh, more or less strongly lensed by this DLS over DS factor. <coughs> they have a diff every source has its own critical density. Again, you have to average these things. And now, in fact, galaxies, I've assumed that the galaxies are randomly distributed. That's not quite the case. We know that galaxies cluster. They like to they like to, to, they're attracted to each other, and so they, they form in clusters. And so around each galaxy, there is actually a projected overdensity of mass simply by the fact that it has neighbors, that there are other galaxies are more likely to be near it. And so the lensing feels this extra mass just like it feels the, the mass of the galaxy itself. And so what you're really doing with galaxy-galaxy lensing is you're measuring what's called the galaxy mass correlation. You're asking around each lens, what is the average amount of mass associated with that lens with that position on the sky, and that includes both the galaxy itself and its dark halo, but also all the neighbors that tend to come towards it because of gravitational uh, clustering. So you're really answering the question, how much mass is there around the average galaxy, which is not quite the same as how much mass is there in the average galaxy. So you have to take this clustering into account when interpreting the results. So let me quickly show some results, and then we will stop until later. Um, this is the uh, result from Sloan, for example. You can see this is the tangential shear scaled by the critical density. So this is now this delta sigma, which is basically the average mass, surface mass density minus the surface mass density at the, the radius. This is just this quantity multiplied by the critical lensing density. So it's in solar masses per square parsec. And out as a function of radius, you see the strength of this tangential shear. <coughs> and out here, at the outer points, you're talking about average ellipticity changes of maybe a fraction of a percent, 0.1 percent. So by averaging over many, many galaxies, we're able to measure extremely small distortion. 
where you make the long axis 0.1% longer and the short axis 0.1% shorter. And it's really because of the high fidelity of these measurements that we can get to this. And this allows us to measure the surface mass densities out to huge radii, more than a megaparsec around a galaxy. So strong lensing would happen somewhere in here. So we're able to extend our lensing information down to a very large radius. We're able to measure the mass profile very nicely. Um, and these are results which are a few years old nowadays. We can actually do much better and have much more accurate profiles. Um, so this this graph it plots the tangential sh it plots the tangential shear right. of several galaxies around a, a single source or, or no, an average is, source. This is averaging over lots of lenses and lots of sources. Okay. Lots and lots and lots. There's probably ten thousand lenses that have gone in here and millions of background galaxies. There's another class? Ah. I think I need one more slide and then I'm done. So. Actually, no. I will leave this for later. You can stop now. Yeah, I will finish this and then continue with the rest of the story. I have one, one more thing to say. There is, a, there is homework for, so today is the last class. I'm leaving this weekend. But uh, there is homework that I've given you for this class. And the homework is actually also the quiz. So the idea is that you do the homework and you hand it in on Monday to Jorge. And then uh, pray and hope that you get a good grade.